Uh, today we are looking at ecology as spirituality. Suppose you live in a really wealthy and wooded exclusive community in Southern California. This is Friday night and young people are partying and they drink a little bit too much and become a little careless and uh, start off a fire in your community. The winds are such that you know, the fire spreads very quickly. Now you would expect that as the fire is a threat to thousands of acres of wood as well as to every house in the community, you will expect everyone to come on board to start fighting this fire. It doesn't matter whether you are a Republican or a Democrat, whether you are Christian or Muslim or Buddhist, or New Agers or Atheist or any, anyone. Uh, it, wildfire is something that ought to unite the whole community in defending the community as well as uh, the uh, natural park or whatever you have uh, from destruction. Likewise, if it is true that factors such as global warming are a huge threat to life on this planet, to the planet itself, that there is a lot of uh, carbon that is being burned by let's say volcanoes, by wildfires and other factors, <clears throat> but human technology, our automobiles, our factories, our electricity plants that are burning coal, um, burning fuel, all of these are producing greenhouse gases that trap the sunlight which would otherwise be uh, reflected back is trapped and therefore is beginning to heat the planet and as they say that just uh, 5 degrees of heat which may be only 1 percent in the oceans and 12 percent on the North Pole and South Pole melting uh, all of the ice caps could cause just immense havoc affecting hundreds of millions of people. Now if the global warming is in fact a huge danger such as this then you would expect ecology to be a factor that unites all of us in an action of lots of actions to try and delay and reverse this fact of global warming. Now that is one issue that we will zero in on uh, while obviously ecology has uh, many more facets uh, than just global warming. <coughs> now unfortunately <coughs> given the, uh, the fact of what human nature is, ecology does not unite, it does divide us and it divides us along religious lines, political lines uh, etc. because that is just human nature because it is not immediate action. We also are reflecting and trying to understand the root causes and solutions. So the common uh, saying or thinking that religions and politics di divide us but ecology can unite us is simply not true. Vice President Al Gore has done a tremendous service to the world through his film An Inconvenient Truth. Uh, there is a lot there in that film which is worth watching and heeding seriously. But if some people take it as a resentment driven uh, political campaign rather than a genuinely genuine care for the earth, uh, that is what the film is. Uh, it is not about the earth, it is all about him and it is about expressing his resentment 
uh, rather than real care for the world, then once again you have that problem of ecology dividing us along political lines. Now, religious division is perhaps even deeper. It was Aldous Huxley who in his novel Island uh, made this classic statement that elementary ecology leads directly to elementary Buddhism. It, it's, it's interesting because since his time two things have happened. On the one hand a number of environmentalists have argued particularly those who came out of uh, the new age movement and feminist movement. They have argued that Christianity is responsible for present environmental mess because the Bible taught that man should establish his dominion over this earth. And that teaching is what is really responsible for our abuse of the planet and rape of mother earth etcetera. Uh, that this has been a very strong charge, but a number of other uh, more serious and careful new age thinkers as they have really studied the problem and analyzed the problem have argued that in fact it is secularism modernism which is responsible for the ecological mess. And Capra himself in his book The Turning Point which was turned into a movie Mind Walk, he argues that uh, the evolutionary doctrines of struggle for existence and survival of the fittest uh, created the ethos that we have to struggle uh, and we have to crush others in order to survive. If, if we can defeat other life forms then we can survive and is this mentality which is responsible for the present abuse of the earth. I uh, will pursue that in a minute, but uh, the point right now is that um, religious divisions attack on Christianity or attack on secularism or Buddhism and Hinduism. A lot of people uh, my friend Jonathan Rice for example, who uh, published two extensive articles in spiritual counterfeits project uh, argues having lived in India for seven years he argues that India is so filthy, so polluted our holiest rivers are the most polluted rivers in the world and it is it has it is directly a result of Hindu belief system. So, ecology then divides us not only politically, but religiously it divides us pragmatically. The question is ok, what do we do about the present eco crisis if it particularly uh, in as much as it is a result of modern technology what do we do about it. There was a whole hippie movement which said that let us follow Mahatma Gandhi, let us uh, reject all technology, live simply, let us not use machine made cloth, let us uh, spin our own uh, threads and weave our own clothes and uh, wear what we can make ourselves and eat what we can uh, grow ourselves, uh, self sufficient villages etcetera. That concept of simple life as the solution to the problems of ecology or the alternative that if technology is the problem, the solution is not in getting rid of technology, but having better technology and uh, safer technology. For example, that if we need electricity, electricity is good, if the problem is burning coal well then let us have nuclear or uh, hydro electricity or uh, solar powered electricity generated through uh, solar cells etcetera that there are many ways of creating electricity and let us have greener safer um, forms of creating electricity or the if it is our automobiles which are burning a lot of fossil fuels lot of carbon and having carbon uh, dioxide as a greenhouse gas 
uh, polluting the environment causing a greenhouse effect and global warming then let us have cars that are hybrid or let us have cars that run on electricity or let us have cars uh, that uh, use corn to make ethanol etcetera uh, fuels that uh, are ecologically safe and good and effective and efficient. So, is the solution in the direction of rejection of technology or more technology and better technology. So, pragmatically uh, ec ecology can divide us along uh, party lines and then of course, philosophically which it would be an important consideration today. Uh, ecology once again divides us many of the new champions of the new age movement they began to argue that we need to worship the mother earth and we need to worship forces of nature. So, animism and pantheism uh, be, uh, became um, philosophical options to save the earth, but not just uh, animism, but also mysticism that we need to go within, we need to meditate and we need to release our psychic energies. And then of course, uh, there is a whole growing Christian movement uh, which is arguing that no what we need to do is look upon creation as a beautiful work of the creator who is our father and hold it as uh, because we love the creator therefore, we love his creation and we hold it sacred and look after it just as if your own father was a great painter and you have the original or let us say your grandfather or great grandfather was a great painter and you inherited the original works of his. Now, you want to do everything you can to preserve them, protect them, display them, enjoy them, uh, but look after them and that is how we are to be treating uh, this creation which is the work of our father. So, philosophically how you look at the creation and at our responsibilities all of that uh, divides us. So, uh, the my first point today is that far from uniting us ecology does divide us and therefore, it calls us to think through uh, why do we believe there is an eco crisis, what causes it, what are the solutions and what must we do. Now, turning again to Capra, uh, his analysis that the theory of evolution social Darwinism which saw life as a as competition as a struggle is at the root of uh, the modern abuse of environment and therefore, the current ecological uh, interest a movement is in fact a reaction against modernism and in that sense it is postmodern. There is some truth to it you are growing corn or you are growing cabbages worms want to eat them, insects want to eat them, you kill them and that struggle for existence survival of the fittest that this corn is for us it is not for you. If you get there in our farms we will kill you, but we all know and we all understand that in fact, this competition takes place within the larger framework of cooperation. Uh, life is interdependent, the whole planet is interrelated, uh, there is a food chain and we, we depend on other forms of life for our own survival and we in fact, sustain them. We, we, we look after them, we care for them and we will discuss some of it next week when we begin to talk about vegetarianism. Uh, but the, the charge 
that the biblical idea of man establishing his dominion over this earth, governing this planet is the root cause of today's ecological crisis. It does deserve some reflection and as we go along, it will become clear that the real problem is not with the original mandate, the creation mandate or the cultural mandate as it is called in Genesis 1. 26 to 30 that God said let us make man in our image and let him have dominion over this earth. So, God made Adam and Eve in his, his image and he blessed them to be fruitful, to multiply, to fill the earth, to subdue it, to rule over the fish and the birds and the uh, animals and everything that moveth upon the ground etcetera. That this command to establish our dominion is that the problem? Or is that command in fact essential to solving ecological problems? Let us say for example, that cars do not exist and aeroplanes do not exist and we are not really causing the global warming or the greenhouse gases. But let us say there is a forest fire in California and also in Arizona and also in Colorado and Oregon in several states there are forest fires they are burning carbon and they are creating carbon dioxide and creating these greenhouse gases. We did not cause those fires, nature caused them. Should we be, should we feel responsible in putting out those fires? Because those fires even though they may not be endangering our houses, uh, they are destroying the housing, the habitat of birds and animals and um, creating problem for the whole globe. Are we responsible? Should we say to nature, no uh, stop this fire, we are going to stop it for you. You nature may have lit the fires itself, but we will stop it because this is not good. Is man responsible? You know you do not ask lions to save endangered species in the forest. You do not live in the forest, lions do, but you do not ask them to save or protect endangered species, you take responsibility. So, is there, is it a given fact that we are in fact the managers, the governors, rulers of nature of this earth and we are responsible. So, when uh, Al Gore is asking us to be responsible for the ice caps in the North Pole and South Pole. Oh, we did not create them, but are we responsible for them? And that is in fact what Genesis 1 26 to 30 is saying that man is uniquely created to manage this uh, earth as God's vice regent as God's child as God's image. He is the ruler, ruler, he is the creator, he is the governor, he is sovereign and he is given the responsibility uh, for this earth to us. So, the problem is not with the mandate, the problem is with its secularization as we will see in few minutes. Uh, its secularization means that we rule out God and then we have to define what does it mean to rule. So, Jesus said amongst the Gentiles their rulers lord it over them, they exploit, they abuse, they oppress, they are dictators, they are authoritarian, but amongst you it will not be so. Whoever wants to be the ruler, whoever wants to be the greatest must become a servant like me, I am your lord yes. But what did I do? I washed your feet. So, you must wash one another's feet. In God's kingdom, the one who serves will be the greatest. So, now if we reject the, uh, the, this picture of who God is, what lordship means, what leadership means, what rule means, then obviously, we define what dominion means and what rule means and it becomes pagan gentile concept of ruling meaning exploit, oppress, 
per word. So, just a brief hint to say that the problem not is not really with the mandate to have our dominion over this earth. Uh, that mandate is necessary to solve ecological problems for us to see that we really are the governors. The, the problem is with secularization, but before we come to that in little detail, let us think of um, this fact that much, much of the ecological concern today at least at a theoretical level, but also quite a bit at practical level is a reaction against modernism and therefore, it moves into a pre-modern mindset such as animism. This uh, lady Michelle Wright, I do not know how, how to pronounce her name uh, from she has a farm Perilendra Jefferson, Virginia and this was one of the first books on new age ecology that I read. Her book is called behaving as if life as if God in all life matters. She, she begins with a description that the cabbage worms were uh, creating havoc with her garden. Now, she was, was against using chemicals to kill worms and, or insecticides, but she was against all forms of killing even if you were killing these worms organically. We should not take any life because all life is divine. So, what do you do with these worms? You worked hard to grow these cabbages and now these worms are eating them. She decided that she was going to pray to the devas of the cabbages. Now, who are the devas? In Hinduism, devas are the celestial beings, like divine being deities, small gods with small g. In theosophy, uh, they are devas are the part of the uh, hierarchy of the spiritual beings that uh, run this cosmos. In other religions like Zoroastrianism, uh, devas are what you would call evil spirits or demons. So, her point was that all life is divine, nature has spirits and therefore, instead of killing these worms, we need to be praying to them, talking to them and the first year she says they obliged. She says well, second year her garden she had tried the same thing, but the garden was a mess it did not work and it did not work because the spirits were trying to teach her some lessons which she does not explain what that lesson was and then she does not really talk about what happened in the third year. But you see the problem if a river is being polluted by industrial waste should we be praying to the spirit that rules the river the deva of the river or should we be praying to the spirit that rules the industrialist and the capitalist or should we be enacting laws and penalizing industrialists who are polluting the rivers. If these industries should not be polluting the rivers and if they do they should be punished well if these worms should not be eating these cabbages what how do you stop them because they do not read your laws and you cannot really take them to court. Uh, so, so you have to do something uh, you, you cannot really be praying to the river can you. So, uh, but, but what is happening in this is a particular philosophical position is driving her towards animism uh, which more philosophically becomes pantheism that everything is divine. If mother Ganges is a goddess then and she is very polluted you are you love that water there is a sacred water you bathe in it you drink it, but it gives you diarrhea and bacteria H pylori and hepatitis and this that and the other uh, because the pollution they say is 34,000 times 
more than is permissible for drinking water, uh, the waters of river Ganges, then who do you pray to? Many uh, intelligent Hindus are realizing that this attitude of uh, treating the river as divine, as a god or a goddess is in fact creating the ecological problem of the problem of pollution in, in India because you believe that these waters are sacred, they are holy, they cannot possibly be polluted, so you do nothing about actually purifying it, cleaning up the river, taking responsibility that we are in charge, we shouldn't be worshipping the river, we should be establishing our dominion over this river. Well, another um, example of a postmodern reaction against modernism is a mysticism, not just animism, but mysticism. I attended a mind body spirit festival in horticultural halls in London once. Uh, this was a new age festival with all kinds of uh, shops and displays and seminars and workshops, etc. In the closing function, we had England's uh, foremost psychic healer, Matthew Manning. He led about 2000 of us into a psychic healing session. He said that uh, England was in a mess because there was too much industrial pollution, but this industrial pollution did, wasn't just caused by England, it was also caused by the continent French and Belgium and uh, Dutch who were pumping their pollution into the English Channel and the North Sea and um, then the air over uh, the whole uh, European continent uh, was getting polluted because of everything and all of this uh, mess, the pollution is there uh, because there is too much negativity being released, hatred, anger, uh, uh, cheating, etc. We are releasing too much negative psychic energy. So how do you heal it? Well, you meditate and you release positive, loving, harmonious, psychic vibration. So we all closed our eyes and we began to meditate and release, send out our positive vibrations to cover the whole hall, outside the hall, the whole of London and whole of England and across the British Channel. We didn't come to America as such, but we covered the whole of Europe and uh, because Europe is bigger problem and, and then the whole globe to heal, uh, the, uh, fight this problem of pollution. Well, this was just about the time when the first Gulf War was starting and um, President Saddam Hussein was threatening that if he is attacked in Kuwait, he will set fire to all the oil wells of Kuwait and he recognizes uh, that the heat that this will create and the carbon dioxide that this will create, will create havoc for the whole globe. Now the problem was, do you send air force to deal with him or do you send psychic vibrations uh, to, to deal with him? This, uh, th th this was an issue that uh, was, as I was sending out these loving vibrations, I was struggling with, you know, how do you really deal with uh, Saddam Hussein uh, at that time? But you, you, you get the feeling of, uh, now obviously Matthew, I don't mean to insult Matthew Manning because he is brilliant. BBC gave him three million pounds uh, to create television programs for psychic healing uh, because he does heal people. But you do have to ask questions that you know what really is happening in, in this. If meditation is such a powerful tool and they believe it is a powerful tool, a powerful weapon to solve these problems because the philosophical assumption there is that the whole physical cosmos is in fact a product, a creation, a dream of the divine mind of Brahma 
which is within us, which is within us. So I am God. I have dreamt of this universe since the universe is a product of my consciousness. My consciousness ought to be able to solve all its problems. The universe exists in the mind of God and therefore the mind of God ought to be able to resolve its problems. But obviously for thousands of years Hindu sages have sat on the banks of river Ganges and meditated, uh, but those meditations have not purified the waters of river Ganges. It remains the most polluted river in the world. So um, let us leave it there. The third postmodern new age reaction to modernism to the idea that uh, we secularize the world. We secularized uh, physical nature and part of secularization was to uh, disenchant the world. The medieval world was enchanted world. There were spirits and nymphs and elves and everybody else uh, inhabiting the planet. But modernism, modernization secularized this enchanted nature. Nature became secular, it was not divine and therefore we were able to exploit it. And what this whole movement is arguing is that in fact to really do away with secularization we need to re-enchant the material world. The material world needs to be uh, enchanted again, spiritualized again. And the real uh, strong intellectual support for this point of view came from James Lovelock book Gaia. James Lovelock is a legitimate chemist and he teamed up with a microbiologist to produce this. Now what they were, the facts that they were looking at have been known for a long time uh, such as that the second law of thermodynamics says that there is entropy or disorganization uh, that happens in any organized system. If you have an organized system, um, it begins to decay, decompose. Now, if the earth is let us say 5 million years old or 5 billion years old, then computers will calculate that by now a total lifeless inertia should have come upon this uh, surface of this planet uh, just by the second law of thermodynamics. Why is there spring every year? Why does this earth keep blooming with life? Like same with salt in the seas, the computers calculate that given the age of the earth as they believe it is, the, there should be so much salt in the seas that uh, life should be impossible. But why is uh, there this tremendous degree of stability that life keeps evolving as they say in the oceans? Well, looking at facts such as these, James Lovelock concludes that perhaps the planet that is not regulated by laws of physics and chemistry, it is regulated by laws of biology. You know our body has tremendous capacity to heal itself, recharge itself. Some of the animals can grow limbs, can grow their tails if the tail is cut off etc. So maybe the laws of biology regulate this uh, planet. Now the implication of that uh, as uh, Lovelock is studying this and moving towards con this conclusion, he suddenly realized that the implication of what he is saying is that the earth is a living system and living organism and then it would be the largest living organism in our solar system. And then he suddenly realizes that if this is what scientific facts are telling us, then uh, it is legitimate to call earth Gaia 
uh, which is the Greek mytho mythological term in Greek mythology, the earth is a goddess called Gaia. So he revives as part of re-enchanting the physical universe that earth is Gaia. Now, the New Age movement picks that idea up and begins to argue that modernism or secularism exploited physical nature because it believed that secular the world was not living, the world did not have soul. If we begin to believe, you know, we have the notion of human rights that human beings should have dignity, human beings should have rights because they are souls, they are immortal souls, therefore they are precious, they are unique, they should not be violated, they have a dignity. Now, if we begin to believe that the earth is a living soul, then we will ascribe same fundamental right to the earth, the treat her with dignity, respect. And if she is goddess, then we ought to worship her, not exploit her and abuse her. So, so this, this became the argument that we need to see the earth as a goddess and that would put an end to the whole modernist uh, tendency to abuse the earth and will make us eco-conscious, eco-friendly uh, generation. But the problem obviously is that is it true that human beings do not exploit what they consider living or that we do not exploit goddess, gods and goddesses. And the fact is that men do think that women are very much alive and necessary and good, but they still abuse and oppress and exploit women, do not they? <laughs> they do think that blacks are alive and living and yet they enslave them. So, it is not true that if we think of something as living with a soul that we will not oppress them or abuse them or exploit them, their argument is not true. And it is not true that we do not exploit what we worship. In all religions, priests and bishops and popes and clergymen and mullahs and malvis, uh, they have exploited their own deities. And in fact, it is easier to exploit gods and goddesses because they do not have fundamental rights guaranteed in our constitutions. So, uh, the question is why is it that human beings actually abuse the earth and abuse other human beings and abuse and exploit gods and goddesses. That is the question. Now, at this point I would like to suggest that Al Gore comes closest to the truth. As you watch the film, you feel that he has very difficult time using the M word, but he uses the M word twice at least in describing that the ecological problem, particularly global warming, is a moral problem. Now, the reason he hesitates in categorizing moral problem is because he knows that his constituency, which is uh, liberal, which is which does not believe in moral absolutes, which is um, going to say, look, all morality is relative, this is moral for you, that is moral for me and this is immoral for you. How can you impose your morality on the whole earth? You know on everybody that you are saying that uh, this is moral and that is immoral, you know how can you impose an absolute morality? Uh, is this universe a moral universe? Is there a given morality which is binding on all people? So, he really hesitates in saying that ecological problem is a moral problem because that would imply an admission that mo absolute morals exist and some things are morally right and morally wrong. It, it, it does not matter what you believe, does not matter what you think, 
a right is right, false is uh, wrong is wrong, evil is evil, good is good. So uh, with great hesitation he does say that and I think he is right. Is ecological crisis a scientific, technical, technological problem? Yes it is. A scientific problem means that there is a direct cause and effect. If you have a lot of uh, greenhouse gases that trap uh, sun rays on this planet in our atmosphere, then the earth will begin to get hotter and hotter, oceans will begin to get hotter and hotter and the ice caps will me melt and there will be all sorts of consequences and which are predictable. If you know the causes and the conditions, then the consequences are predictable in that sense they are scientific. So, ecological problem is scientific, but it is more than scientific, it is moral in that the causes are chosen deliberately by people. Now, we do not choose volcanoes, we do not choose necessarily wild, uh, wildfires, sometimes we do, sometimes we do not. But we do choose whether going, we are going to create electricity by burning coal or use water or use nuclear energy or chemicals. We do use whether we are going to drive a gasoline driven car or a hybrid car or electric car. We have a choice whether we are going to burn carbons to go from here to there or burn calories, walk or bicycle or swim. Uh, we have those choices and so, so in as much as we freely choose, um, we are responsible. But then morality also has a second dimension which is that cause is freely chosen and effect is also not a mechanical automatic effect but is chosen by whoever is an authority. Let us put it this way, a mother says to a child that if you do not make your bed, you are not going to go swimming today. Well, there is no cause and effect natural automatic relation between um, making your bed and swimming the effect of not making your bed is that you have a messy bed, uh, that uh, people do not like coming into your bedroom because it is too dirty etcetera. S swimming has no logical connection with not making your bed. The effect or the consequence of not making your bed that you are not allowed to go swimming means that someone who is an authority someone whose law you have broken, he or she determines or chooses the consequence. The cons cause is freely chosen by you that I am going to defy my mother and I am not going to make my bed. And so the punishment or the consequence is also freely chosen by whoever's laws you have broken uh, either by him or her or someone authorized by him and her there is freedom, there is choice both in cause as well as in consequences. Now, this is the nature of moral law and this is very important to understand the biblical worldview. The Bible would agree with Al Gore that ecological problem is a moral problem. Human choices are the causes and effects are not just mechanical, there are some mechanical natural consequences of not making your bed or burning too much carbon and unnecessarily burning carbon, there are natural mechanical uh, predictable effects, but there are also unpredictable uh, results which come because we are breaking someone's law. Is this a moral problem? Is there a moral law? that we ought to be taking care of this earth where, why, whereas we are not taking care of this earth and therefore deserve punishment. And I want to suggest that in fact the biblical answer is yes, ecology is a moral issue both in its causes and in its effect. When you begin reading Genesis and we need to read the Bible from beginning to end, 
Genesis 2 15 says on both in fact chapter 1 and chapter 2 and particularly uh, the verse 15 of chapter 2. Uh, uh, these two chapters tell us that God created man not out of himself. So, man is not emanation of God as Hindus would say that we are God, we are extension of God. But God in fact took Adam from the dust, from the earth. Earth is Adama, clay is Adama. Adam is taken out of Adama, he is related intimately with the earth. God then breathed his uh, spirit in Adam and Adam became a living soul and God put him in a garden to take care of the garden. So, Adam is taken out of Adama, but turned into God's image to take care of the earth. He is taken from the earth to take care of the earth. Adam was not created to live in a non-material heaven as a spirit being forever with God. He was created as a physical bodily being created out of the mud, out of the earth to live on this earth forever taking care of this earth. That was the purpose of Adam's creation. So, th that is uh, first part of the biblical worldview. Now, the first sin, the original sin was in fact an ecological choice. God said to Adam and Eve that I have given you this garden, all the fruit trees that you see and all the seed is yours to eat and enjoy. But there is this tree, there is the two trees in the middle of the garden, a tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, this is something that you should not eat. The day you eat, you will die. Adam and Eve became moral beings when the law was given that thou shalt not eat this fruit where there is no command, there is no morality. You become a moral being, you become a responsible being when the command is given. Now, a lot of people like to think of that, that command as mythological. But what exactly is happening? Now, imagine Adam wakes up every morning, he looks at this tree, it is beautiful, laden with fruit, great to look at, smells wonderful, is tempting and he is hungry, he wants to eat, but he can't eat, not from that tree. Why? Because he is told not to eat. That tree then becomes a daily 24-7 reminder to Adam that although he has authority in this garden, his authority is given to him and his authority is, is derived and is limited, it stops with that tree. I am in someone else's garden. You know, it is like I come to your home and you are real nice to me and you say, we shall, here is your room, just feel free, help yourself to the fridge and anything uh, that you see in the house, uh, you know, just feel at home. Well, you are very kind, but obviously you do not mean that I should help myself to your credit card. You know, I have, you have given me authority in your home, but there are limits to that authority because the authority that I have is derived, is limited. I am not the owner master of all that I survey as William Wordsworth who said I am the monarch of all I survey, I am not. That is what that tree is saying. When Adam takes that fruit and eats it, what he does is that he oversteps the limits of his authority. So, here is an ecological command that you created to look after this earth. You have authority, as the manager you have the authority, you can decide whether you are going to have a red rose here or a yellow rose here or a white rose here 
um, or you don't want any roses, you want roses there and you want fruit here. You have that freedom and authority. But you are to take care of this earth. You are under authority, you are a steward, you're not the owner. This is God's creation. It's beautiful, it's perfect. Don't mar it, don't corrupt it. So the original commandment is an ecological commandment and the original sin is an ecological sin. Adam overstepping the limits of his authority over nature. Therefore, the consequences are also ecological. The ground is cursed. Now, it is tempting in our day and generation to see Genesis chapter 3, the story of the fall of Adam and Eve, as a mythological chapter, a mythological story. But in reality, that chapter answers some profound questions for which we don't have any other possible explanations. Clothes. Why are we the only species that is ashamed of our own bodies? Why do we have to wear clothes? Every generation thrives nudity, but it doesn't work. Because we are the only uh, species that is ashamed of our own bodies. We are the only species that has a sense of guilt that I'm wrong, that what I did was wrong. And that guilt is a terrible, uh, a terrible um, phenomenon as you see in Shakespeare's Macbeth, for example. That guilt is a terrible driving force. So there is an alienation from within ourselves. We are alienated from ourselves. We are also alienated from the people that we love. Adam, did you eat the fruit? No, 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 this woman that you gave me, she, <laughs> she asked me to give the fruit. You know, the person that you're supposed to love, you start to blame, dislike, hate. And it's not, it's not just limited to husband and wife. Cain uh, kills his brother Abel. There is alienation uh, within the family. Love is replaced by hate and then it extends, of course, to neighbors. There's alienation between man and animals and we'll talk about it next week when we consider veg vegetarianism. There's alienation between man and nature, the ground is cursed. And let's come to the curse in a moment. Uh, before that, the most important thing, result of sin is in as much as sin is defying God's decree, edict, commandment, it, we, we rebe it's a rebellion against him, therefore it's an alienation from God. We are alienated from our father, from our creator, and that becomes the root of all other problems. We've defied him, and then there are consequences. It's like a child who is not making his bed, even when the mother tells him to make his bed, it's not simply that the bed is not made, it is that he is rebelling against his mother, he is rebelling against her authority, and that's where alienation comes in, um, which, um, which, which has consequences. The, the curse is an important thing. So I'm saying that Genesis chapter 3 offers explanations of some problems which are unique, uh, uniquely human. Uh, one, of, one of them obviously is what happens to Adam. God says that because of your sin, the earth is now cursed. It will grow thorns and thistles for you. It will, you will have to work very hard. You will have to eat of the sweat of your brow. Now, man is the most rational creature on this earth. Some of our billionaires can save store enough food for seven generations and clothes and everything else. Their children need never work. But the fact remains 
that in spite of this tremendous ability that we can uh, create a lot of wealth, a lot of food, surplus food, we are the only species that, have, that has to eat of the sweat of our brow. Our dogs and our cats and our parrots and our fishes, they don't sweat unless we force them to sweat. They eat, they live, they're clothed beautifully. But we are the only ones and you say, well, I don't sweat because I have air conditioned home and air conditioned car and air conditioned office to work at. Well, you have to live with thorns and thistles even if you don't actually work on the farm, the thorns and thistles may be in your home, in your offices, above you, below you, on your side. Um, and if they don't give you actual, uh, uh, make you bleed in your body, they give you blood pressure and <laughs> heart attacks and things like that. So uh, that reality that you have to live with thorns and thistles and bleed in order to eat is real. Why is it so? with human beings alone. I'll explain in a moment, but let's take uh, the, the, the people that have really hated Genesis chapter 3 have been the radical feminist, both biblical feminist and secular feminist, that this is the chapter that institutionalizes oppression, oppression of women because it says, your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. Uh, this is terrible. The fact is, whether you live in a patriarchal culture or a matriarchal culture, whether you worship father god or mother goddess, all women all over the world feel oppressed by their husbands, their fathers, their loved ones. Why is that so? God said to Eve that I'm going to increase your pregnancy and your labor pain. You will give bear, uh, bear children with pain. Childbirth is a most natural process. We are sexual beings. Sex is primarily for reproduction. Childbirth is very natural. But why is it that the female of human species has this unique uh, labor pain? Our cats and our dogs and our cows don't experience anything like that. I was talking to a new age Jewish woman once and she says, no, this is all myth that there is no labor pain. I was uh, lassoing a horse when I gave birth to my daughter. Uh, she had been t taking lessons on creative visualization and uh, so she was visualizing lassoing a horse while she was giving birth. I said, well, that's my point that your horse doesn't have to uh, practice creative visualization in, uh, while giving birth. You have to, uh, because labor pain is a uniquely unique curse upon the female of human species. There has to be an explanation. Why is it so? So it, it's not wise. My point is that it's not wise to dismiss uh, Genesis chapter 3 as a myth offhand. You need to read it more respectfully uh, and carefully that what is this chapter saying? There is alienation. Uh, let's focus on the curse upon the earth. Because of your sin, the ground is now cursed. Now it will grow thorns and thistles. You will have to work very hard. Work was already there before the fall. God is a worker. He worked for six days. He made Adam and even his image to be workers. So to work is righteousness. To work is godliness. Toil is a curse. Toil is mindless, repetitive labor, which does not include voluntary choice, includes no creative intelligence, no creativity. That's toil. You have to do it. You're forced. You can't say no. And uh, uh, you have to do it morning and evening, every time, every day. Y you don't have any choice and no creativity. That's toil. That's a curse. But that's reality. Now, what God is saying to Adam and Eve, is that, uh, particularly to Adam at this point, I, I gave you abundance. There was abundance in this garden. But now you will not have that abundance. You will have to work hard in order to eat. If you don't work hard, you won't be able to eat. You won't, it won't produce 
uh, enough food. Why is that so? See, work plays the same role in our lives that sex does. The primary function of human sexuality is to make two people one. Sex is a super glue. You take two pieces of wood, join them with a super glue, they're really glued. You try and separate them, the glue doesn't come out, the chips come out from both. So you separate a husband and wife, it hurts and it hurts for the rest of your life because you'd become one. Chips come out from both the blocks. You know. So that's what work does. Just as sex binds us into a social community, into a family, work binds us to nature. A shepherd becomes, is bonded to the sheep. A teacher is bonded to her students. A carpenter is bonded to his wood. A musician is bonded uh, to his instruments. So work binds us to our nature and we take care of our sheep or our students or our patients or whoever, whatever our work is. We love it, we are bonded. What Adam and Eve have done, they have abused their authority over nature and God is saying that now you will have to work much harder when he says you will have to eat of the sweat of your brow. He's saying that now you will have to work much harder in order to eat. If, if, in other words, you'll have to take much better care of earth, much better care of the garden in order to eat. If you don't, you will not be able to eat. It's going to grow thorns and thistles. So that curse is an ecological curse, a blessing to the earth. You have to be bonded to this earth much better. You have to take much better care of this earth. Otherwise, it's not going to produce your food. And this actually gets intensified after the flood when the lifespan is cut short further. And uh, we will discuss this a little bit more when we talk about vegetarianism. But um, uh, I hope you'll remember some of this uh, as we uh, uh, ne next week because this is just the background of the next uh, next week. But this curse implies that Adam it, it reinforces that Adam was create Adam was created to look after Adam. He has abused his authority over Adam and God is saying that now you have to work very hard. It has a consequence. The consequence is that when you are so attached to your work, every evening Eve is going to say to you, Adam, you are late again today. She is going to be mad at you. And she says, well, you don't really love me. You love your work. You love your colleagues. You're married to your work, that's your spouse, that's my rival. So I'm going to leave you, I'm going to find another alternative for myself, something, someone that I can be attached to, someone who has time and energy for me. You know, you get come back so you're so tired uh, that you don't really want to talk with me, uh, play with me or anything. Now, that's where God says that, okay, while Adam has to take care of the earth now, this uh, is going to create pressure on their marriage and so I'm going to change the instincts of Eve and Eve, I gave you a lover to live with, you've helped him become a sinner and the big human problem now will be how do two sinners live happily ever after. This is going to be the heart of human problem. How do two sinners live happily ever after? So God says, since the pressure will be for you to separate, I'm going to have to work on your instincts that your desire will be for your husband. But since he has become a sinner, he will abuse that. He will rule over you until I re re change him, transform him. Tell him what it means to be a ruler, uh, to, become, uh, to become servant. 
So now th this is what is happening in Genesis chapter 3. A, a, a worldview is being set up which helps us understand the rest of the scriptures, particularly the kingdom of God. But let's return to ecology. The points that I've made so far is that Al Gore is right, the other New Age interpretation of ecological crisis are wrong. Al Gore's interpretation is right that this is a moral problem. But the nature of morality is that it cause and effect are not ne pre necessary, predictable. A mother can say that if you don't make your bed, you're not going to go swimming. Or she could say, if you don't make your get bed, you're not going to have ice cream. She's free to give whatever punishment she wants to give. Now, God, if it is his law that we are breaking, he is free to give whatever punishment he wants to give. And very often, as a result of our wickedness, God punishes us by punishing the earth, punishing environment. So that's, that's uh, repeatedly the case in Isaiah 24, verse three, uh, 1 and 3 to 6. God says, Behold, the Lord will empty the earth and make it desolate, and he will twist its surface and scatter its inhabitants. The earth shall be utterly empty and utterly plundered, for the Lord has spoken this word. The earth mourns and withers, the world languishes and withers. The highest people of the earth languish, the earth lies defiled under its inhabitants, for they have transgressed the laws, violated the statutes, broken the everlasting covenant. Therefore, a curse devours the earth, and its inhabitants suffer for their guilt. Therefore, the inhabitants of the earth are scorched, and few men are left. In Psalm 107, verses 30, 30, 33 and 34, and the psalmist says that he, that is God, turns rivers into a desert, springs of water into thirsty ground, a fruitful land into a salty waste because of the evil of its inhabitants. So sin has consequences. We defy God and often he gets back to us by dis destroying the earth, by punishing the earth to get back at its manager, sup uh, supervisor, governor. Likewise, our righteousness affects nature. Psalm 107 continues to go, uh, continues in th verses 35 to 38, that he turns a desert into pools of water, a parched land into springs of water, and there he lets the hungry dwell, and they establish a city to live in. They sow fields and plant vineyards and get a fruitful yield. By his blessing they multiply greatly, and he does not let their livestock diminish. The classic verse, of course, is Second Chronicles 7.14. If my people, who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. So, it is a moral problem. We are making deliberate wrong choices. And moral problems and wrong choices have natural consequences, but they also have supernatural consequences. Immorality is breaking God's law, defying God, this rebellion against God. And then God punishes, curses, puts consequences. If it is a moral problem, then solution involves repentance, asking for forgiveness. Now that's the part that uh, Vice President Al Gore doesn't get. It's a moral problem, what's the solution? Vote for me. If it is a moral problem, then solution simply isn't that you vote for one part or the other. You might have to vote, you might have to pressurize whatever party you belong to. But the, ultimately, the solution to the moral problem is that we made wrong choices, we need to repent, we need to say sorry. 
So is ecology a spiritual issue? Now this is uh, one of the in-house battles, prominent in-house battle within the Christian world in America. Is ecology a spiritual issue or is it a secular issue? It is not a secular issue. Secularism is the cause of ecological mess. It is a moral issue. It is a spiritual issue. It is part of pro-life agenda. If you are pro-life, you have to fight against those environmental factors that promote death, right? Global warming, floods, hurricanes do take away lives. You can't be pro-life and not be pro-earth and pro-environment and pro-abundance. Uh, you have to be. So it is a spiritual problem. What does it mean to love God with all our hearts? To love the Creator means to love His creation. You can't love God and damage his creation. If your father was Rembrandt or Leonardo da Vinci or your grandfather or great grandfather was Leonardo da Vinci, you can't love your father or your grandfather and destroy his great work of art, can you? Even if your child made a flower and it didn't look like a flower, it looked like an elephant, uh, you would still put it on your fridge because my child went to school, came back with this flower. If you love your child, you will love his work. You will honor his work. You will respect his work. He wrote a poetry. It is an atrocious poem, but you will treasure it because this is the first poem of your little child who started going to primary school. So, what does it mean to love God? Among other things, it means to love his creation, to hold it sacred. Secularism has in fact abused the earth. The solution is not in re-enchanting the earth by making her a goddess, or making rivers and trees and bushes and earth as gods and goddesses and spirits, but making it sacred that this is my father's work. It was meant to be perfect. It is not perfect now. It is marred and it's marred because of my sin. Thorns and thistles have come because of my sin. The creation is subjected to futility as Paul says in Romans 8 because of our sin. Therefore the creation is waiting anxiously for the appearance of God's sons who will who are God's children and will therefore look upon this earth as the handiwork of their father and hold it precious, hold it valuable, love it, take care of it. And not only loving God involves stewardship of nature through diligent work, loving our neighbors involves fighting fires that threaten their very lives, their existence, their property, their houses. So if global warming is a threat to our neighbors, they might be living in Bangladesh, they might be living uh, in Shanghai or wherever, but you can't love your neighbors and not take preventive action when you see a threat coming which could be beyond their ability to handle. So Romans 9 again, Romans 8, 19 and 21 tells us that the creation is waiting with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. The Bible is a book of hope and I want to conclude with that in a minute. But biblical salvation is not simply our souls going to heaven. 
But biblical salvation is restoration of everything. In the final judgment, it isn't simply our souls that are going to hell, but God is going to destroy those who destroy the earth. That's Revelation 11, 18. Our sins have destroyed the earth, and God is going to destroy those who, are de going to dis who destroy the earth, uh, Revelation tells us. So what is biblical salvation? Very often we think of salvation as our soul going to heaven. Or is it a new Jerusalem coming down from heaven to a renewed earth? The glories of the nations being brought into, into that uh, new Jerusalem, the holy city. Uh, Revelation 21, 1 to 4 says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men. He will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. The question is, will the fire of God on judgment day burn up this earth? Is this earth waiting to be burned up? Or will the fire of God refine this earth as the fire of a silversmith refines silver? A lot of English translations have mistranslated a verse such as 2 Peter 3.10. It says, But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire. And the earth and everything in it will be burnt up. Some translations such as NIV say, And the earth and everything in it will be laid bare. The Greek word is, the earth and everything in it will be found. The same word as used in the story of the prodigal son, my son was lost, now he is found. That's the, that, that's the word. The Stoics believe that the earth will be destroyed. Peter is saying to them, that, no, the creator is faithful to his creation. He isn't here to destroy this creation. Man has become fallen, sinful, ugly, dirty, rebellious. God isn't interested in destroying man. He doesn't want anyone to perish. He wants to turn us into a new creation. Behold, whoever is in Christ is a new creation. Is there com complete discontinuity from the past? Is it new heaven and new earth as in a brand new earth is being created? Or is it a renewed heaven and a renewed earth? The Greek word in fact is uh, not brand new but renewed. Just as when we come to Jesus, we become new creatures. We are born again. We are new creatures. But in fact, we are renewed creatures. We remain the same. There is continuity from the past there is also discontinuity. Some things are terminated. Fresh beginning has been made. Seed of God has been planted. Our lives are being transformed. That's what Paul, uh, that's what Peter is saying in 2 Peter 3.10. The, the, uh, when he says the elements will be uh, destroyed, he's not talking about the elements of modern chemistry of hydrogen, oxygen, and iron, and uranium. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking those basic elements of world's philosophy that enslave people. It's the same word, uh, stoicia, that is used in Galatians and Colossians, that don't let these basic principles of the world enslave you. These are going to be burnt up. Uh, the elements, ABC of astrology, uh, that enslave you. These will all be burnt up. The fire that he is talking about, he is quoting from Malachi 3.2. This is the refiner's fire. Silver is put through it. Dross is burned. Silver is refined. Creator, 
loves his creation, he is faithful to his creation, he cares for his creation. The analogy is from Noah, where the flood destroys, but it doesn't annihilate. God, in fact, puts his a rainbow as a promise that never again will I destroy the animals and the earth as I've done. He cares for his creation. He's recreating heavens and the earth. All the damage that our sin has done to this earth, God is interested in removing it, refining it, purifying it. And that's our responsibility as his children. Creation that has been subjected to futility and decay because of our sin is waiting for the children of God to appear who will behave like Adam and Eve to take care of this earth. He made one garden. Adam and Eve were co co uh, commissioned to turn this whole earth into a garden by being fruitful, multiplying and filling the earth. That's our mandate. So the question in the end, the chief question before the American church is, how did the Bible, which has been the world's strongest book of hope, became a book of a pessimistic eschatology? The, the American church during the last 50 years, the leaders of the American church, many of them, have said to the congregations, that you give us your billions of dollars and we will take it to go out to the whole world, the uttermost parts of the world to spread the gospel. But be sure, as we spread the light of the gospel, the darkness will keep growing. The light shall not overcome the darkness. The yeast of the gospel will transform nothing. The world will become from bad to worse until Jesus comes back, everything is burnt up and you are raptured. This has been the eschatology. And I suggest that these faulty translations that shape this kind of thinking are a result again of secularism. The Bible made the West an optimistic civilization, a progressive civilization that problems can be fought and overcome and conquered. Secular modernism secularize that hope that we can overcome anything without God, we can create utopia. That humanistic hubris, pride, overweening pride in our own abilities that we can create utopia without God, led to the birth of fascism, Nazism, communism, the two world wars, the oppression of the uh, communist system. So by the middle of the 20th century, that humanist hope went up in smoke in mushroom clouds over Nagasaki and Hiroshima. We saw that we were not as good as we thought we are. We are not as capable as we thought we are. Far from creating whole national utopias, we cannot even create happy homes because we are sinners. So as the secular world became pessimistic, that optimism which was stolen from the Bible and was found that impossible uh, on our own strength, that secular pessimism was then in the 1940s, 50s, was baptized with biblical verses and developed this theology of the late great planet Earth which America exported all over the world. That's not biblical theology. The Bible is a book of hope, the book of hope. The book of Revelation is a book of hope. There will be tremendous problems, political, military, natural, but the end of it, there is a throne. Every tear is going to be wiped away. Every problem is going to be removed. The curse will be the salvation will extend to as far as the curse is found. There is going to be utopia. There is going to be kingdom of God. God is going to wipe every tear away. Death and hell themselves will be defeated. Death itself will be defeated. Death and hell are not the first consequences of sin, although those are the only consequences of sin we talk about. 
the, they are the last consequences of sin. The thorns and thistles, the problems of alienation, these are the early consequences of sin. And the salvation saves us not just from hell and death, it saves us from all the consequences of sin. That's what God is doing, redeeming the earth, redeeming his creation, because he's faithful to his creation. And he's inviting us as his children to be his ambassadors, to be his fellow soldiers, to be his partners in this task of redemption. This is the true <coughs> spiritual foundations for ecology. And um, reaction against modernism, reaction against secularism and social Darwinism is right and legitimate. But the solution doesn't lie, lie in turning to Hinduism or Buddhism or any animism or idol worship or nature worship. Uh, solution lies in turning back to God, our Father, coming, uh, coming to him with repentance, humbling ourselves. And as we humble ourselves and pray to him, he says that he will forgive our sins and heal our land. Thank you very much.